Good, yeah, so welcome everyone for the Cloud Computing and Big Data course. Um, today is lecture six, Deep Learning Driven by Big Data, and it's my pleasure to have um, an invited lecture today uh, from real an expert in the field. Um, his name is Gabriel Cavallaro. Can you introduce yourself maybe a short amount of time, please? Thank yes. you. Yes, thank you very much, Maurice. Uh, yeah, I'm Gabriele Cavallaro. Um, I was actually a PhD student uh, at the University of Iceland at the Faculty of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Uh, I was working under the supervision of uh, uh, Professor Jonathan Benedictson uh, on uh, um, application from remote sensing, uh, which were related to the use of satellite images um, and use machine learning approaches to detect uh, automatically objects from this data. Um, so I spent basically from 2013 to 2016, uh, after I uh, finished my PhD, um, I started my postdoc at the uh, Yuli Supercomputing Center, which I'm, still, uh, which I'm still holding the position. And so my main focus at the moment, uh, so I place myself at the intersection of three main domains. Uh, so remote sensing, application for remote sensing, uh, machine learning, deep learning methods, and high performance computing. So I'm in the intersec at the intersection of the field, trying to uh, make connection and um, trying to basically uh, be able to leverage the computational power, uh, the advanced methodology from deep learning to solve large scale remote sensing problems. So that would be all from my side now. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for taking this lecture today and I think the students can really learn something and also um, for the students here on the course uh, if you have questions how a PhD life looks like I mean today would be Gabriel speaking we have on Thursday Rocco speaking he can also tell you something so don't hesitate send us emails and I will redirect to um, Gabriel and Rocco if you have questions about you know what it's like to be a PhD at the University of Iceland so but before we dive into the material of lecture six, you know, usually we review the last lecture and um, let me just briefly cover that. So it will be very much shorter than usual because here we've already also start a new, let's say area in this. We will have a machine learning um, model area, which is much more complex than what we have learned before. And also from the methodology it should show you and from the technology needed, we need much more computational capacity. But before we go this way, uh, let us review what we had basically in the last couple of lectures where we had this MapReduce approach and we learned that it's basically a divide and conquer strategy with a very smart idea in the middle, which is done by this framework and meaning there's a specific key value structure that you can use so that the framework takes away lots of automatism um, basically, and, and give you grouping, shuffling, sorting functionalities, which is incredibly useful for lots of applications. However, we carefully reviewed that and said, when it's very iterative behavior that we have sometimes also in machine learning to iteratively learn from all the samples, um, Gabriel will go into this actually in his lecture today, much more than we had before. Then you will start more and more getting a feeling that always map reduce, map reduce iteratively is maybe not the best way to go. So there are other paradigms we have to look in. However, MapReduce is incredibly used often in every cloud essentially that is out there. You will see examples in the Google Cloud with the data proc service having essentially the whole ecosystem around Hadoop, around Spark supported. These days it's also very nice integrated with Jupyter, what we have seen already in the Microsoft Azure environment with HD Insight. There we had also the large, let's say, or larger Hadoop ecosystem where we not only used essentially Spark, for instance, we also used actually the, the queries from Hive, we used the HBase databases. So there are lots of, let's say, technologies which are normally open source, but have also lots of different versions to it, which makes it a bit less let's say easy to bring them all together. And this is, I think, a key benefit you can take away from these clouds. They have, of course, um, images. They have an installation that is harmonized to each other. So you can make sure if you use Apache Pick together with Apache Hive that will work. You use Hamahoot on top of Hadoop. You have basically the different versions that fit together. So in a sense, this is a really benefit of clouds. 
And also when you think about the fault tolerance that we had underneath the MapReduce approach, here and there we see um, HDFS, a Hadoop distributed file system, it's another advantage. And you see here on the bottom left, it was really working nice. Um, essentially, this word count um, creating, you know, then basically a, in a distributed fashion, these kind of word lists that we saw also on the outcome then. Of course, we have also seen that sometimes the required resources are not there. However, it is also an educational package that we have, so we should not forget that. If you go to production, this is, let's say, less likely that you have really a problem with this. But you see there, it's running on a specific type, MX5 large, X large, you see there. But uh, the drawback, of course, would that be, is that you have to pay. The better the computing underneath, right, with the EC2 that you see on the top right, the kind of elastic compute cloud, the more powerful the resources are, the more you cost, you know, the, the more you have to pay for that. And with this, you have the key problem of, you know, the clouds in a sense. And when you then go to GPUs, which we will reveal in actually practical lecture 7.1 a bit, and then in lecture 7 already with GPUs, then you're very quickly getting too much more costs. But I think that's all what I really wanted to leave on the table here for you. You will have, you know, do your hands dirty in another assignment of logging in into a system using the secure shell I demonstrated last time. And of course, we're using a little bit different clouds, not only Microsoft Azure, we will use Amazon for it. And I think that's all what I have to do and to say from my side um, and leave Gabriel to take over again. Thank you very much for giving the talk, Gabriel. Thanks a lot. Okay, so let's start. Uh, this, is, this is the outline of the course. You see we are at lecture six now, deep learning driven by big data. And here is the outline of this lecture. So I would like to start um, by revisiting the, uh, the fundamentals of machine learning and basically um, talk again about uh, what you've seen already in lecture two, which is the linear perceptron model. So we will see how it works uh, and what is the, the, the main limitation of this model. After that, we will uh, start to discuss uh, multi-layer perception and particular neural networks. Um, here we'll see what are the advantages of using such networks when compared to, the, to a linear perceptron model and what uh, these networks, uh, what kind of problems the network can solve. Afterward, we will move to deep learning. So uh, there will be a very short introduction. You can imagine that such a topic needs a full course, if not even a full master, I would say, uh, to, to, be, you know, to be discussed into all the aspects and details. So here I will just give you, uh, you know, a very high uh, overview of uh, what is the definition of a deep neural network, a bit of uh, what are convolutional neural networks and how can we train them, how can we make them, you know, uh, clever. And if there is some time, then I will give an example of, of big data. So uh, in my case, from my research field, that is uh, that are satellite data. So as you can see here for the promises, so what I will cover is not everything in this lecture. What I will cover here is insight into deep learning algorithms. Uh, I will not cover in this lecture TensorFlow Keras. This is something that will be covered later on. I will provide more details about artificial neural networks and deep learning networks and that can be used for, uh, for different data. Um, I will talk about uh, what the, how the feature selection works, uh, what, is, what does it mean when you need to, uh, uh, when you need to solve uh, an image recognition tasks. And uh, we will talk just uh, very briefly about uh, GPUs, uh, where are actually needed in the training process. Uh, but the collab part will be covered uh, later on. Okay, so let's start. So here I condensate basically uh, what you already seen uh, in this slide, in the next slide, in the lecture two. So you see here, you, uh, you basically really check one practical problem, uh, which is um, the detection or the, cl the classification of um, a particular, uh, two particular type of flowers, or Iris setosa and Iris virginica. So here the idea is that you don't have an exact uh, rule or method that you can uh, directly, or formula that can be used directly to solve this problem. So the idea is that if you have some data uh, and labels, uh, you want to learn from this data some, somehow and be able to, to create a model, so a classifier, which then is able to generalize. Able to generalize means then uh, later on, I will come with a new image, right? And uh, this model will be used to, uh, to discriminate 
automatically uh, if this flower is iris setosa or iris virginica. So in this example, you see what are the ingredients, the necessary ingredients. Well, you need to have data, obviously, uh, not just raw data, but you need to also to have classes. So it means that for each image, you will have a label which tells you that this is a iris setosa and this is iris virginica. And, and, and then you're ready to start. Of course, um, the selection of the type of classifier and method will be done according to the, uh, the amount of data that you have, the, the, the complexity of the problem, and, and different aspects that we will cover here. So what you saw uh, is basically a, a very simple classifier, the perceptron. Um, you can see, you, if you remember, there was some uh, analogy with the, with the brain. So you have the concept of neurons and how they are interconnected. So what you have here is a, is a classifier on the right hand side where you have um, a series of inputs and these inputs are uh, basically um, your training data. So you have your training data, right? So you have different images. For each image, you have a label. And what you do, uh, you basically take an image and you stretch it, right, in the, in the dimension side in order to give it to the input to the, um, to the, to the perceptron. And the perceptron basically uh, needs to uh, take each input and uh, multiply for a particular weight. Now, these weights represent basically how strong is the connection, right? And this is exactly the similarity that I was referring before with the brain. So once you then um, perform this linear operation, you then apply an activation function, which will give you a sign in this case. So for solving the, the problem that we have here from the, from the flowers, it means that we are gonna have to have two classes, which we can assign to minus one and plus one. And after we will pass all the, uh, all the samples, all the images, we will finally obtain uh, classifiers. So the formula here, which basically will place a uh, decision boundary um, according to the weight that has been learned. And after that, you will be uh, ready to go and use it as a classifier for new, for new samples. Okay, so uh, the question now is, can we use this classifier uh, for all the problems, uh, any problem that we might uh, encounter? Um, let's see. So uh, here, I, for instance, I take uh, the XOR problem, which is basically very simple. You see the, uh, the true uh, table on the left side. So the requirement is that you will have two inputs. And if the two inputs are equal, you will get a zero as the output. And if one of the, and if the two inputs are different, you will get a one. So here you see um, the feature space. So you see the different, uh, the different answers of the outputs. And, uh, and the question here is, 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 is the perceptron able to separate, uh, to make a separation on this, uh, this problem, this domain space? And the question is no, as you can see here, there is no way to, uh, to make a uh, decision boundary that is able in, in one shot to uh, discriminate uh, directly uh, this, uh, this problem. So this problem is not linearly linear, linear separable. That's the, uh, that's the point. Um, so in order to, to solve such a problem, and of course, more complex problem that you might find in, uh, in, in real applications, right? Um, what people started to do back then is to um, create a more complex architecture. So if we, if we consider again the same problem, um, if we take not only one uh, perceptron, right? So not only one perceptron, but we stack them together in a particular architecture. Um, this will enable you to, uh, to, to draw uh, decision boundaries that uh, will be able to solve such, uh, let's say more complicated problem, not separable, linear, linearable separable problems. Um, so if you see here, you still have your inputs coming in in the input layer, but then what you have is a hidden layer, right? And, and this is the addition that we do here, which is then connected, which are, so these two layers are uh, completely fully connected. And then at the end, you will get still an output layer, which will give you again the sign plus, plus, uh, plus or minus one, according to the class that will be decided. 
So please note that each of these circles here is still uh, your perceptron, right? You still have your inputs coming in and you still have uh, an activation function inside, right? Okay, so just remember that. So each of these is still a perceptron, but they're just stuck all together in order uh, to, 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 to try to solve the, this uh, more, complex, uh, more complex problem. And here you see how uh, this, uh, the actor with the hidden layer can actually solve uh, this, uh, this problem. So uh, this is the so-called multilayer perception. Um, this can basically uh, uh, derive different decision boundaries. So we can say that a two-layer network classifier can all implement a linear decision boundary, as we saw uh, for the problems before, um, but uh, with a sufficient number of hidden units. So, at the, so if we had if we had the hidden hidden layer, um, then we can uh, theoretically implement uh, an array arbitrary decision boundaries. And this is, you see also an example here. <clears throat> so if we look now at the full structure, uh, or the full architecture, you have it here. Of course, uh, we are not bounded to, uh, to a single hidden layer, right? So we can have uh, multiple hidden layers. And this, uh, this is something that we will see later uh, that um, discriminates actually uh, from classical machine learning to, to deep learning. So how deep we go, so many hidden layers we get. So this is one of the aspects that uh, might classify uh, a method as a deep learning method. <clears throat> but the point here is I wanted to just, you know, summarize with you what is the now the structure that you deal with. Remember each of this uh, circle is still a uh, perceptron. So inside of each of this uh, um, node, you still have also an activation function, right? And so, and the multilayer perceptron neural network can be used as a universal approximators um, in any classification problem that you might encounter, uh, also in real applications. Um, they can uh, basically uh, derive nonlinear discriminative uh, discrimination functions, or nonlinear boundaries. And this is done basically by just making this more complex, so just connecting uh, everything together. Okay, so here, uh, this is just the final uh, structure that uh, you should now remember. And at the end here, you still have uh, your, uh, each of the, of the node that you have at the end here is still, for instance, uh, uh, according to the number of classes that you have. So if you had the binary classification problem, you might have just two uh, or multiple if you have uh, multiple classes, like for instance, multiple flowers to classify. <clears throat> So um, the role of activation function, I think you already saw something in the lecture too, but uh, their goal is to introduce uh, nonlinearities into the network. So if we have a problem here again, uh, two classes, but you can see that the line uh, wouldn't really work much. Um, and if we just keep an actor, right, without uh, linear, without activation functions, uh, at the end, in the actor you, you saw, we just do a linear operation. I would just do multiplications and summations. So you, the reason why you need to introduce uh, um, activation function is exactly to enable uh, actors to uh, perform such complex decision boundaries here. And you see here an example. <clears throat> um, there are many, uh, many, uh, many activation functions that has been proposed. Um, of course, uh, this is something that has been uh, done during research and during, you know, mostly trying out different type of, uh, you know, solutions uh, on problems, right? Um, you see here, for instance, if you, if you were giving these lectures, you know, some years ago, uh, we were just talking about maybe sigmoid, tan function. Nowadays, we talk more about ReLU, for instance. Um, so you see, these are just functions that takes a single number and performs a given operation. So this is nothing really uh, complex. So once you get your answer uh, from uh, the neuron, then you will get an a value and the function will just you know, give an, uh, an output value according to the function. Here they might think, the, the thing that you should maybe take into account is that um, according to the operation that you do, so you see here there is an exponential in the sigmoid function um, this, for instance, this operation has been seen that is a bit more computationally expensive. And that's why, for instance, ReLU now is uh, working much better because you see you don't have any of this. And it works much better also for, the, uh, for speeding up uh, uh, the, the training point. 
So you see, there are many advantages, disadvantages to use them. If you start working, uh, if you start, you know, to make your own nectar, you will probably start also experimenting them. Um, nevertheless, uh, there is a lot of, you know, there was a lot of uh, codes available and people already solved many problems and guides. So you basically have guidelines which will tell you at least, you know, uh, which um, activation function might actually work better for a particular problem. Um, of course, this is still a parameter that you will have to uh, uh, decide when you build your network. So, uh, but, you know, before we continue, I would like to just, you know, be sure that you don't, uh, you know, exit this class and think that, you know, if we take a perceptron now and we add an activation function, then we are, we are able to solve a nonlinear problem. Uh, this is not true. With the perceptron, you're not capable, you're not able to solve uh, nonlinear problem, even if you add an activation function, right? So here you see an example, for instance, you see a perceptron um, with the logistic sigmoid, uh, which is an activation function. And you see, you still have the, the shape of the surface, um, but you know, by changing uh, the weights, uh, so when you learn by changing the weights, you might still you know, change the direction you will might stretch the, the surface or shift it, but the shape will be remain uh, the same, which means that you still uh, basically uh, deal with a, a linear uh, mode, a linear classifier, which will not, which will not be able to solve uh, no linear uh, separable problem. And in order to show you this, I would like to to do a little test. So there is a, this nice website from TensorFlow. It's called. Uh, Neural Nectar uh, Playground. So here I give you the, the, the website, but this is something that we can try maybe now. So I will just uh, move to the website. So what you can see here is that you have many uh, parameters which I didn't talk about yet. So uh, let's, let's just keep them fixed like that. You, here you see that you have the activation function uh, on sigmoid um, and you have a classification problem. If you basically see here, you have your data, you can, uh, choose different uh, classification problem. Here we start with the, with the easy one. Um, and then you see here we have now a perceptron because we have only, you know, the input coming here and we just, you know, go directly to the output. And once you select all the, all the, all the features, you're uh, ready to go. So we can start to, to train the network. And as you can see here, uh, obviously we have an easy problem and the perceptron is capable to, to solve it uh, without uh, any problem. But if now we, um, we change uh, the classification problem, so we go for a non-linear problem, as you can see here, um, and we, we have a perceptron, right? But as you see here, we have also the sigmoid activation, right? So this is gonna solve this problem. Let's see, let's try, let's try to train. And as you can see, um, as I told you in the slides, um, this is not possible. So you still have one decision boundary that is, that is linear and is not able to, uh, to solve this particular problem. So um, as we said in the theory, what we can do is to start to add, for instance, one hidden layer, right? So we can start to add one hidden layer in the middle. And we can start, for instance, by having only one neuron. Um, also this neuron will have the same activation function and we can start to train it and to see if uh, this works. So with one uh, neuron, uh, you still not you're, you're not still capable of solving this problem. This is not enough. So what you can do is to uh, introduce uh, more neuron. So we can start. Uh, we we'll try with two now. So by the way, here you see in the output you see the test loss and the training loss. These are basically the matrix that tells you how good you are in the in the testing parts when we want to see if your classifier is actually doing correct or not. But you see here, here we have, for instance, one hidden layer and two neurons. And you see that now that uh, the decision boundary is not more aligned anymore, but you know, it's starting to, to be uh, more complex. That's something that we get before, but this is still not enough, right? So let's try with three now and let's see if we can do something. And you see now uh, boundaries are getting more complex. You're getting now two regions for the, uh, this binary classification problem. So, but I guess you, uh, you are getting the point, the point that, you know, um, at eventually uh, with one layer, one hidden layer and enough um, neurons, 
you will be uh, capable of uh, solving this problem, uh, right? Uh, something that you were not able to do with a single uh, with a single move. So you see here, it takes some time, but eventually you see now on the test we are very good. We are almost covering and se um, making separation between the different uh, problems. So actually, this is almost yeah, this is capable. So you see, four neurons, we are done. Right, so I think I encourage you to try this. You can also find different classification problems and you can try different activation functions. And the other parameters, so the learning rate will be maybe more, uh, uh, let's say clear later after these lectures. Um, maybe also the batch size. So this is something that you might try. So I will come back to the slides now and continue. <clears throat> All right, so, so now I will slowly start to enter into the, um, into the deep learning part. And uh, I would like to, again to consider uh, the classification problem you, uh, you, you saw already, so the, uh, the flowers, right? So um, at the end here, what you were asked to do is, was to uh, detect and make a distinction between two types of flowers. Now, if you're not an expert, right, um, and you know, you just uh, see the pictures of the flower, um, I guess you'd have no idea uh, what are the, the attributes or the features, so the properties um, that uh, will make you uh, be able to distinguish if a flower is one of class or the other class. So uh, please remember when I talk about attributes, features, I'm talking about the same thing. So here, for instance, if you remember, if you look at the flower, um, you had different attributes features, which are related to, for instance, to the length of the sepal, um, and you have this, uh, the length and the white, right? So these are features um, which someone, uh, which, which some has expert on flowers uh, knew that these are actually important features. So these are important features that will enable you to discriminate uh, these, uh, these two flowers. So again, you need an expert uh, that knows uh, in advance what could be the exact features or the most informative features to, um, to be able to solve a problem like this one. So that is the, um, the main deal here. So, um, and this is something that, uh, I mean, this is, was the, the main, let's say, the main uh, approach um, before deep learning arrives. So what you have to do is, so you have your data, so you're an expert for instance in flowers, so you're an expert in the earth observation, and you have your data, and what you need to do after do some pre-processing, the pre-processing could be just related, you know, to just you know, prepare the data, uh, in, you know, just maybe storing the data or like normalizing the data. This is something that is just related to the data itself. But in terms of information, it will be on you, it will be your responsibility as an expert to sit down and understand and study what are the features uh, that are the properties of your data that um, should be extract, prepared in advance before you uh, apply any, any type of classifier, which could be a perceptron and neural networks or whatever. So you need to um, prepare the feature in advance uh, in that case of the flower, there will be someone, you know, uh, taking the, the, the picture of the flowers and, you know, extracting the lens uh, of, the, uh, of the different uh, characteristics. Once you get these features, so once you basically uh, announce the data set, so you start from raw data set or from the picture of the, uh, of the lab of the, of the flowers, and then you add these features, so this uh, lens, and of course, you also need to uh, make labels. So you also need to say, you know, in advance, I tell you that, you know, I will have this training, that, this training set, where I have all my images, I have my attributes, but I have also the label, which tells you this image is uh, that particular class. Once you have all this, uh, then you can apply supervised learning, which means that you can give now this data, well-prepared and easy data, I would say, that can be solved by, uh, a, a classifier, an easy classifier, which could be, for instance, a very shallow neural network. So this could, this was the basically uh, the main the, the main step that always being done in any classification problem <clears throat> in order to get to the final label. 
So now the promise of deep learning is that you, um, you are done with that in a way that, uh, so you have your data, um, you might still do, uh, need to do some pre-processing, but this is just related to maybe for some you know, brightness or uh, normalization of the data, something that can be you know, done mechanically. But um, the, the feature, so the understanding of what are the informative feature, that would be actually done automatically uh, by, the, um, by the deep neural networks. So you see here, there is no more someone sitting or like you know, doing a lot of work before the actual classification, but you include both steps in the same architecture where you have uh, the structure of the features and the uh, classification at the end. So in a single architecture. So this is, uh, so if someone asks you, you know, if, you, if someone asks you what is the difference between machine learning and deep learning, this could be, could be one of the first answers that you could give just to, you know, to make a distinction between the two, um, uh, these two topics. Um, so here uh, we are uh, repeating, but uh, let's uh, maybe say it again. So you see in the first part, you have shallow learning. That's also a term that we use because you know, we have a very uh, small, uh, small network. So maybe a few, just few hidden layers. Um, and why do you need a simple network? Because you made the problem already easy. So you just, you made it available. You made the feature space um, easy and probably not linear separable, obviously, but you know, um, the, in this new feature space that you created with the features, um, there will be not probably necessary to create such a complex uh, decision boundaries. That's the thing. Um, while in deep learning, you see here, uh, it means that we are going deeper. So you have many, many layers. Um, of course, you know, there is still no universal of set, uh, let's say rule to say, you know, when is uh, in terms of number of layers, but in, when is machine learning, deep learning is something that, you know, comes, uh, uh, individually of the type of nectar and application that you use. But um, what you can see here is the most important you know, part is that each layer at the end will be able to extract automatically uh, the different features from low level to high level. Here you see, for instance, some example from uh, face, face recognitions. And this is something that is done by the, by the nectar by itself. So you don't need to extract or prepare filters that are able, you know, that extract this kind of uh, feature. This is done automatically. And once this will be achieved, then you will finally perform the, uh, the classification. So this is the main difference. Right, so deep learning. So let's now see what, uh, why deep learning is actually uh, emerging so much nowadays. So of course, uh, one, uh, one motivation I already, I already gave it to you, this very nice property that, you know, you don't need to hopefully spend too much time for the feature uh, preparations. Um, and so the other reason are the following. So um, the deep learning can be seen as a subset of uh, machine learning, you can see here, and also in a subset of artificial intelligence. Um, deep learning is emerging as a leading AI technique for the following reasons. So first we have a convergence of scalable computing capability so uh, you, nowadays we have, of course, more uh, powerful and uh, let's say more affordable uh, computing devices, starting from desktop computers, uh, GPUs. Um, so uh, basically, uh, the, everyone in theory with the GPU could already start doing a lot of stuff. <laughs> a lot of, uh, of deep, could ready to start deep learning. Um, but of course then you for the real problem for the big problems uh, then you we are ensured that we have accessibility to a more uh, let's say more computational powerful um, infrastructures like high performance computing but also cloud computing right so cloud computing and this is exactly what you're studying in this course <clears throat> maybe in the future we will see also the advent of new uh, computing uh, paradigms like quantum computing uh, this is something that will be interesting to see. Quantum computing will be also, uh, will be probably necessary to solve particular optimization problems. Uh, but yeah, we will see it's still early. So the computation is here. So you, this is something that, you know, you are here, you know, working with your uh, deep neural network and you can rely on such an amount of, you know, computation and possibilities, which is, you know, more affordable. 
And the other uh, aspect is that nowadays we have access to large amounts of data. So from the internet, this was you know, getting better and better. Um, so what I can tell you from my uh, domain of research, so of observation, remote sensing, is that nowadays you can imagine that we have a lot of satellites over there. Um, and you can imagine the amount of volume and the amount of data and variety of data that these, these uh, satellites acquire. But the most important aspect is that nowadays, uh, modern Earth observation programs make this data available for free. So uh, data that are acquired from a satellite are available in a few days already, which means that everyone uh, could, uh, can download them and use them. Uh, so to train, for instance, uh, neural networks and deep neural networks. Uh, of course, uh, these data are raw, right? So nobody, uh, oh, let's say, this amount of data still need to be labeled, right? So uh, you still have to give a sense. Uh, you still have to say, okay, this uh, image or this pixel of this image is some particular object in order to prepare your training set, right? Um, and there are many research groups around Europe and in the world uh, preparing these benchmark data sets. Uh, this is a lot of work. Uh, this is a work that is still have to be done by experts. Um, but of course, nowadays, you can also uh, opt for different type of learning procedures which are not supervised, which means that you will not need to have uh, labels, but you will basically learn everything from the raw data. Yeah, but this is something that is more advanced and is not, the, let's say, the objective of this lecture, but this is possible. And of course, this is the, I would say, the, um, the, the next, uh, the next year objective, especially in our community. So let's maybe uh, doing this before maybe the break. I don't know how much time I've left, uh, Morris. Yeah, slowly coming to an end of the first part would be good. Yeah, Perfect. but we started also a bit later, so it's not so drastic. I will just cover these two slides. So just to summarize, so you see deep learning at the end. Um, what we can say use a generic flexible model family which are the neural networks with multiple layers here you see again an example so the difference is that when compared to a simple neural network here you're talking about many many layers and what you can imagine already is that when you have many layers which means many connections which means uh, much more computation which means more time for training, right? So that everything is connected. At the end, you need to consider that whenever you have a connection here is a computation, right? You need to, to, to compute these weights because at the end, what really matters here is what are the weights that you uh, compute in such an actor because the weights will basically decide uh, the decision boundaries, right? Of your, uh, of your problem. So um, these are the uh, things that uh, the, basically these are the the parameter that has to uh, to be optimized so right because at the end you have your inputs the input is the input you cannot change the input you cannot change um, the labels the labels of that one what you can only optimize are the, the weights so the how important are the different connections between the different uh, neurons um, still remember that inside of each of uh, of each um, uh, label uh, in each Note here, you still have your, uh, you know, your uh, multiplication with the weights and the activation function. So at the end, um, where does the computation arise? So why deep learning needs uh, high computation uh, power? Because, because of course we have, as I said now, uh, all these connections, all these operations uh, that need to be done. Uh, so this is not just about the single element, but how you uh, put everything together in a big, in a big architectures. And this would cost you uh, a lot of, com lot of computation. Um, so this is what we would call, uh, let's say, fully connected neural network. So at the end, you need to see here that everything is connected to each other. So you start from your input layer, so where you put your data. And what we have seen now, so the, the architecture that we consider until now are, uh, is the following. So where everything is connected to each other um, between the different, uh, the different layers, right? So each, so each neuron will just propagate uh, uh, the output and according to the weights that will be, you know, again, multiplied and sum up and activated and, and so on until you arrive to, um, to the final layer where you will decide uh, about uh, the class. 
And we've seen that uh, we can consider this as a unar uh, universal approximator. Um, there are different ways to training, and we will see that uh, in the later slides. But uh, what now we will enter after the um, after the, the break is the question: How, um, if this kind of architecture is still, uh, let's say, is still the could, could be the best one or not to um, to solve to solve a, a, a 2D uh, image problem? So if you remember, we have the images before from the flowers. So the question is: Is this the optimal architecture to solve such a problem, or this is something better that we can do? And so this is exactly what I would like to start after the break, and we will start to talk about uh, convolutional neural networks, which are uh, powerful networks that's been quite widely used, um, and that exactly designed for solving uh, problems like this one. Okay, so I would like to stop now, maybe. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Gabriel, for this. Yeah. Um, actually, Iceland uh, was very happy that you gave this talk and agreeing with this with an earthquake, I think, uh -oh. during your lecture, <laughs> which was, let's say, a mild one, luckily, but yes. interesting enough experience. Uh, probably some of you have also heard that. So we continue at quarter past. Okay.